Some of the sweetest words ever uttered. He is not here. He is risen. Jesus is alive, folks. Let's give praise to the Lord. Well, we are so glad that you have joined us for, this is our fifth out of six Easter services as we gather together to celebrate the risen Lord Jesus. We just first want to welcome those of you who might be with us for the very first time. If this is your first time with us, would you mind raising your hands? The ushers want to give you something just to give you more information about our church so you can take it home, read through it, learn more about who we are and ministries that are available here in the life of the church. So uh, just keep your hands up as the ushers come up and down the aisles. And the rest of us, let's just welcome those who are here for the first time. We're glad you joined us. Uh, we are expecting this service to become full, so in a moment I'm going to ask everybody to greet each other. And when you are able to stand up, would you mind if there's seats kind of scattered in your row, if you wouldn't mind just kind of getting close, crunching up, loving each other, getting a little bit closer so you can leave the empty seats on the aisles so the ushers can seat people more easily. It's great to have you with us. Let's stand if you would please. Greet each other, welcome each other, say Happy Easter to somebody. Happy Easter, everyone. Would you stay standing? We're going to sing some songs together. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met. Yeah. I was breathing but not alive All oh, my failures I tried to hide It was my tune Till I met you Come on, sing it out you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Day. Your mercy has saved my soul. Come on. And now your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew. Jesus, when I met you, yeah, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. Yeah. 
alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in oh when death was arrested my life began amen oh when ash was redeemed only beauty remained on oh, my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet and my feet rose to dance all oh, when death was arrested my life began oh your grace so free washes my chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom faithfully born oh he canceled my debt and he called me his friend that's when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so displayed on a criminal's cross and darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost
kiss of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving let's sing this out together God you're so good God you're so good God you're so good you're so good to me thank you Jesus behold the cross age to age and our says that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us so that in him we could be righteous before God. He alone is worthy of our praise. Rumors of the Son of Man and stories 
memories of a Savior Holiness with human hands A treasure for a traitor No ear had heard, no eye had seen Till heaven came to live with 
Would you join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, you are worthy of your name. We praise you today. We give you thanks. This is a day of miracles, a day of celebration. We give you praise, Lord. And as we participate in this offering, by the giving of our tithes and offerings today, we ask, Lord, that you'd use them for the purpose of helping men and women, boys and girls, know about Jesus, their Savior, who wants to be their Lord. Both in Leesburg, Loudoun County, around the world, Lord, we pray that you do remarkable things. Bless those who give and bless the gift. May it be used for those purposes. We give you praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated and turn your attention to the screens for announcements. Hi, I'm Michelle Buckner. We're so glad you're here and hope you're enjoying the service so far. Pastor Gary's going to come in a few minutes to give a special Easter sermon. But before he does, we wanted to take a minute and let you know about some of the things going on around the church in the upcoming weeks. Everything I'm about to go over can be found under the events tab on our website at cornerstonechapel.net or in our mobile app. The first event is our Christianity 101 class. This class is for those of you who want to know more about the basics of the Christian faith. It starts on Wednesday, April 11th at 7 p.m. in the ministry room. No sign-ups required, so you can just show up. If you're new to the Christian faith or have had the desire to be baptized, our next Baptism and Rec Night is next Sunday, April 8th at Ida Lee Rec Center in Leesburg. There is a required class being held this Wednesday, April 4th at 7 p.m. in the ministry room. Make sure to invite your family and friends to celebrate with us and then stay afterwards for some recreation and swimming. It's going to be a great night and we hope to see you there. If you're new to the church within the last couple months, we'd like to invite you to our new visitors lunch on Sunday, April 15th at one o'clock in the cafe. This is a great opportunity for you to meet some of the staff and learn more about our church. You can sign up online at cornerstonechapel.net. Speaking of our website, it's the best place to get the most up-to-date information about things going on around the church. Or if you're on the go, you can download our mobile app from the App Store or the Google Play Store. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and like us on Facebook. Just as a reminder, our normal service schedule will resume this Wednesday at 7 p.m. with our midweek series, The Answers to the Questions You Thought We Forgot. In this series, Pastor Gary will be answering your questions about popular topics like creation versus evolution, lifestyles in the Bible, and end times. Our normal Sunday service schedule will resume next Sunday at 8.30, 10, and 11.45 a.m. And we'll be starting a new series in the Book of Song of Solomon, so make sure to join us for that as well. All right, that's going to do it for our announcements. Thanks again for being with us, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the service and come back and see us soon. God bless. All right, folks, so that's some things happening in the life of the church. We hope that if... Cornerstone is not your church home, you'd consider making the church your church home and get involved with us. Wanted to take a moment to uh, welcome our online viewers, and we have a bunch of people in overflow rooms in this service too, but we have some people watching from Romania and the Netherlands, plus the overflow. So let's welcome everybody who's also watching. I wanted to let you know too, in case you weren't aware, that we do have children's ministry for infants through fifth grade. If you want to take advantage of that, you can just go to the education wing uh, or see one of our ushers and they'll help direct you in, in the right location. Uh, it, does anybody else find it humorous besides me that it just so happened this year, Easter falls on April 1st? It's like the day that Jesus punked the devil. He's like, devil, I'm dead. Not really, <laughs> jokes, you know, <laughs> Easter fool. Anyway, I'm going to share a little bit of the Easter story by kind of weaving together three different passages from Matthew 28, Luke 24, and John 20. So this is normally the place where I would say turn in your Bibles to, but you'll probably not be able to follow along as I've just kind of woven a lot of the verses together just to give you the overall background to this story that we've come to celebrate together. So let me read starting from Matthew 28. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. 
The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we're just so grateful to be able to join together today here and those watching online and millions of people around the world today as we honor you and as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, be glorified here in everything that you see, and we pray you'd move in our hearts. Those who already know you, Lord, this would just be a time of rejoicing. And those who don't know you, that it would be a time of opening their heart to accepting you today. So we pray for that in advance, and we love you and give you all glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Well, I heard the story about this small plane that was uh, ready to crash, and uh, there were four passengers on board, but only three parachutes. So the first passenger gets up and says, well, I'm a renowned heart surgeon and my patients need me and snatched the first parachute and jumped out of the plane. The second passenger stood up and said, well, I'm a rocket scientist. I'm the smartest man in the world and my country needs me and grabbed the second parachute and jumped. Well, now there's only one parachute left and two passengers, an old man and a 10 year old boy. The old man said to the boy, son, Listen, I've lived a good long life. I got most of my life in the rearview mirror now, but you, you got your whole life still in front of you. You go ahead and take the last parachute. The boy looked at him and said, Mr. Thanks anyway, but actually there are still two parachutes. You see, the smartest man in the world jumped out of the airplane with my backpack. <laughs> Just when things seemed hopeless, it was actually hopeful. And that's really kind of how our story is, because 2,000 years ago when Jesus first is hanging on a cross, it seemed pretty hopeless. As he's hanging there dying for the sins of the world, his foes mocked him, his friends, they mourned him, his disciples, they deserted him. Jesus died. He was buried in a tomb. It seemed hopeless. But three days later, God raised him from the dead, and we have joined with millions of people around the world today to declare that Jesus is alive. Amen. Now, I, I know to uh, many of you this is a familiar story, and you're here to celebrate. And to others of you, this is an unfamiliar story, and you are here to investigate. And still to others, well, you have a drug problem. Somebody drug you here. And you don't really want to be here, and I get that. I just want you to know, you know, as a pastor, I recognize that this time of year at Easter and then also at Christmas time, some people come to church who don't normally come to church. But I just want to say on behalf of our church family here at Cornerstone, whatever your reason for being here, we're glad that you're here, and we pray that you'll open your heart to the love of Jesus who died and rose again for you. So thank you for being here. We're glad to have you. Now, statistically, 81% of Americans celebrate Easter. 81% say that they celebrate Easter. But almost half of that, 42% of Americans know the real, the real meaning of Easter, only 42%. 
the majority of Americans celebrate Easter as some kind of, you know, the advent of spring. And for that reason, Easter has become the third largest commercial retail day in America. After Christmas and Valentine's Day, Easter is number three. Uh, we will spend on all things Easter $18.2 billion this year. $18.2 billion. And interestingly, they will make 90 million chocolate bunnies around the world. Yeah, woo, yeah. <laughs> All right, now, I don't know if this applies to the woo-hoo in the crowd, but here's an extra stat for you. 59% of Americans say they eat the chocolate bunny ears first. Does that apply to you? <laughs> Are you ears first? Now, here's the, even a more staggering number. Listen to this. We will consume this Easter 1.5 billion marshmallow peeps in 43 different flavors. I don't know if you know that there are 43 different flavors for the peeps. Uh, last year, right before Easter, uh, Terry and I were down at National Harbor. I was speaking at an event at the Gaylord, and after, afterwards we walked down to the water area, and there's actually a peep store. Did you know this? It's like, it's like every day it's open throughout the year. How many of you have been down to the National Harbor and been to the peep store? Let me see your hands. Okay, my peeps, yeah, all right. now. It's incredible, I'm not making this up. Pancake and syrup flavor. That's, that's good, don't moan that. <laughs> don't knock it until you've tried it. A lemon meringue, orange sherbet, triple chocolate stuffed delight. I mean, the only thing better would be if, if you were to take two Krispy Kreme donuts <laughs> and put a chick in between that, delicious. <laughs> I went into that store very innocent. I came out a peeping Tom. It was ridiculous. I, I'm not really a peeping Tom. It's just a peeps joke. All right. But we, I hope we all know, though, that Easter is a lot more than all that. Easter is a lot more than all that. And really, that's the reason why Easter is the number one church attended day in America. Uh, it's the number one church attended day next to Christmas and Mother's Day. 50.5% of Americans will go to church today. Half of all Americans will go to church today. And why? Because down deep, people know that the real message of Easter is not found in an Easter basket, but it's found in the Bible. This is what declares the truth of Easter, the Bible. And for, for those of you who aren't familiar with what Easter really means, in a nutshell, here it is, that God stepped into our world 2,000 years ago in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus enters the world scene and He says things like this in John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Can't get to heaven except if you go through Christ. This is what He says. He also says, I came into this world not to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. For whoever believes in me shall not be condemned, but whoever does not believe in me stands condemned already because he has not believed in God's one and only Son. So he makes these strong claims. Some believed him, many did not. Isaiah the prophet 700 years before Christ would predict that Jesus would be a man despised and rejected by men, that Jesus was acquainted with sorrow and familiar with grief, and true to the prophecy of Isaiah, most of the people of Jesus' day denounced him, rejected him, despised him, and then they crucified him. They strung him up on a Roman cross. Little did they know it was all plan, the plan of God to redeem the world. But it was their vitriol towards Jesus, proclaiming himself to be God in flesh, that drove them to this anger to crucify him. He dies on a cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. The death couldn't keep him and the grave couldn't hold him, and three days later, God raised him from the dead. Now listen, no other world religion makes this claim, and no other religious leader makes the claim, either prophetically or after the fact, to have risen from the dead. All right, nobody goes to the empty tomb of Muhammad. Nobody goes to the empty tomb of Buddha or, or Confucius or Gandhi. There's only one empty tomb in the world, and people from around the world go to see it in Jerusalem. It's the empty tomb of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, because He's alive. 
Now, if, and I would say since he's alive, the question becomes then, well, where is he now? Because if you're not familiar with this story, then you might think, well, okay, if he rose from the dead, did he die again? Where is he? No, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, rose from the dead, and that after 40 days, for the period of 40 days, he appeared to people giving many convincing proofs that he was alive. It's well documented. It's historical. And then after 40 days, he ascended back into heaven where he presently is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And because of his finished work on the cross, which is why he said on the cross it is finished, he ascends back into heaven, and now he opens heaven, and now we have access to heaven if we believe in him and if we surrender our lives to his lordship. So this is, this is what God has done for us by offering His Son Jesus on a cross and then opening heaven for us who believe. This, this whole thing about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is either, the, is either the greatest event in human history or it is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated upon the human race. And it leads to two questions. Number one, how can we know that this story is true? And number two, what does this story mean for you? So I'm going to start with the first thing. How can we know that this story is true? So let me ask you this. Let's just say, let's just say somebody uh, very uh, popular in your neighborhood dies. Suddenly dies, I mean completely dead, it's, it's no question about it, got, got the tag on the toe in the morgue, dead, dead. Everybody knows it in the neighborhood, everybody's grieving, family's planning a funeral. Three days afterwards, you, you go to the family's house with a pie that you've baked to pay your respects. And when you get there and you knock on the door, who opens the door but the dead guy? Now, if the dead guy opened the door, what's the first thing you do? Drop your pie. That's right. <laughs> the next thing you do, I guarantee, next thing you do, you do this. Hey! <laughs> That's what you do, because not every day you see a dead man, right? So it'd be like, word, had pie with a dead man, word, please like me. Oh, please, please somebody like me. Stop that. But that's what you do. Now, let me tell you something. That's exactly what the disciples did. The disciples took to social media. They did. Now, in that day, social media was, we're going to talk about it, we're going to write about it. But that's what they did. They went around talking about it. The eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ went around talking about it, telling people about it, and writing it down as a matter of historical record. So, for example, Peter, one of the apostles of Christ, an eyewitness of his resurrection, he's preaching a sermon shortly after Christ has risen from the dead, and then after he ascended, Acts chapter 2, Luke records, writes down what Peter says as an eyewitness, and this is what Peter says, Acts chapter 2, 31 and 32. He says, Christ was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. That's what he says, and Luke writes it down. They're spreading social media. They're getting it out there so people know this is an incredible event that has happened. The apostle Paul, in a similar way, Jesus also appeared to Paul, as Paul was on the road to Damascus, the risen Lord appeared to him there. And Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, kind of writes a synopsis of the many different ways that Jesus appeared to people, including to himself. This is what he writes, 1 Corinthians 15. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, which is just a euphemism for death. He says, and then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. So these guys write this stuff down, but now listen. They didn't just talk about it, and they didn't just write about it. They died for it. They died to defend it because that's what you do when you really know it's true. You don't do that for a lie, right? Some people may die for the truth. Nobody dies for a lie. 
If, the, if these guys knew, oh, we're just kind of, this is a little hoax, this is a little April Fool's joke, you know, this is just a little thing, we're covering it up. The moment their life would be required of them, guarantee you, they'd recant. Okay, they don't recant. They die defending the truth because they know it's true. So Peter, history tells us, will be crucified upside down. He had the option of being crucified right side up, but he said, I, I don't want to die the same way Jesus did. So out of respect to my Lord, just crucify me upside down. Paul was beheaded. Ten out of the twelve disciples were all martyred, either crucified or they were stoned to death or they were killed with the sword. And not only them, since the first century around the world, more than 70 million Christians have died defending this truth. They've been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ and would rather die than to recant something because they're willing to die for the truth. Of the 70 million since the first century, 10 million have died just in the last, uh, sorry, 1 million have died just in the last 10 years. On average, a Christian dies in this world every six minutes, every six minutes, not to defend a lie. How can we know this is historical? Because millions of people have died defending it. That's how true it is. It is one of actually the most documented historical things in human history. Outside of the Bible, there are 39 other ancient manuscripts and texts that record the life, the miracles, the ministry, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to quote a couple of really smart guys, like Professor Thomas Arnold, who was appointed the chair of modern history at Oxford. He's the author of the famous work, History of Rome. He wrote this, quote, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort than Christ's death and resurrection from the dead, end quote. And also, Brooke Foss Westcott, an English scholar and professor at Cambridge during the 19th and 20th centuries, he said this, quote, raking all the evidence together, it is not too much to say that there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ, end quote. Now, the truth is, it's not my job to convince you. That's the work of God's Spirit, and He'll bear witness with your own heart about this. It's only my job to present the information. God will do the rest. But it will take faith. You will have to exercise faith to believe this, because none of us was there. In fact, even someone who was there uh, needed a little faith. And Jesus even anticipated that we would be here today and need to accept this by faith. Here's what happened. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not there on the first day when Jesus appeared to the rest of the disciples. And they're telling Thomas about it. He's like, ah, yeah, I don't believe any of this. And that's why he's called Doubting Thomas historically. He says, unless I see and put my hands in the nail prints of Jesus and touch the side where he was wounded, where he was stabbed, I'm not going to believe this, guys. So the next week Jesus appears to him. And Thomas does just that. He touches the nail prints and puts his hand in the side and then he's, then he's undone. And he says before Jesus, he goes, my Lord and my God. And Jesus says to him, you have believed because you have seen, but blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. That's you and me. We weren't there. You're going to have to exercise faith. But historically, it's a pretty well-documented event. So how can we know that it's true? Number two, what does this story mean to you? Peter, one of the twelve, one of Jesus' disciples, who was an eyewitness of his resurrection, would later write in an epistle, 1 Peter, it's in the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He, he came away with just kind of a summary of some important points related to the resurrection of Christ. This is what he said, 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. He said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade kept in heaven for you. This is what Peter says. Basically, it comes down to two things. He says, because of God's mercy, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a living hope. 
we have a living hope, and we have a promised inheritance of heaven. So let me start with living hope first. What does that exactly this mean? I think all of us would agree, nobody in the room would disagree with this. An important element to humankind is hope. Everybody needs hope. It's a critical element to humanity. And equally so, it is a very debilitating thing when someone has hopelessness. In 1957, to kind of scientifically document the importance of hope, a scientist by the name of Dr. Kurt Richter, who was a biologist and a geneticist at Johns Hopkins University, did an experiment. Now, I'm going to tell you what the experiment was. I'm going to just tell you in advance. Don't send me any emails. Because in the process of his experiment, some rats died, okay? So there you have it. Now, here's what he did in 1957. He took some wild rats and he put them in some glass cylinders that were half filled with water, large glass cylinders half filled with water, and he put the wild rats in these glass cylinders half filled with water. It was enough that they had to tread water, but not enough that they could escape out of it. And he documented and he watched. On average, these wild rats would tread water for 16 minutes, on average, and then they would give up and they would die, they would drown. So Dr. Richter then took out those rats, got a whole nother set of fresh wild rats, and under the same conditions, same model, same water temperature, same everything, put these new wild rats in those glass cylinders, half filled with water, and observed them. Around the 16 minute mark, when these rats typically would succumb and just give up and die, Dr. Richter pulled them out of the glass cylinders, dried them off, and fed them. Then he reintroduced them back into the water. And this time, to his amazement, they did not survive and tread water for 16 minutes, not even 16 hours, but for three days. Why? Because he had introduced hope. You see, the ones who gave up after 16 minutes felt like oh, this is hopeless, it isn't going to work. And so instinctively, they just gave up. But when you introduce the element of hope, they just continued to thrive for three more days. Now, if that's true about rats, how much more true is it about us? Human beings need hope. We, we were created with the need and the capacity to be hope-filled people, but there are a lot of hopeless people in our world, a lot of hopeless people. Brad Delp, the former lead singer of the music group Boston, took his own life about a decade ago. And when they found his body, he had pinned to his own shirt a note. It was written in French. And it said this, Brad Delp, j'ai une âme solitaire. Brad Delp, I have a lonely soul. There are a lot of people like that in this world. People who just feel hopeless. People who are on the brink of despair or suicide or brink of bankruptcy or the loss of a loved one or a shame about something that they've done or just physical or emotional pain because of something in life. There are a lot of hopeless people. And so what Peter's saying to us is please know that through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are given a living hope unlike what this world offers. That unlike what this world offers comes this hope through a relationship with Jesus Christ, a living hope no less. And this is why Paul would add in Romans chapter 5, he talks about how suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope, and hope will not disappoint us because God has poured his love into our hearts. What the world needs is an infusion of hope, and that comes through Jesus Christ. What does the resurrection story mean to you? It means a living hope that we can have in knowing our Savior. Hebrews 6, 19 says that the hope from God is like an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. Because a hope with the Lord is this, comes with it this, this, this expectation of something that is greater than what this world offers. So if you're here and you feel a sense of hopelessness, please, 
Open your heart because Jesus Christ came. He loves you. He died for you. He rose again that we might have a new birth into a living hope that is found in him. But Peter also adds, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. He talks about heaven in that way. He says, we have an inheritance in Christ, which is heaven. Now, listen, all of us know that you only get an inheritance if somebody dies and leaves something to you. And this is in effect what Jesus did. Jesus dies, rises from the dead, ascends back into heaven, and he leaves us a will. And his will is basically revealed to us in the pages of the Bible. And, and the will basically says this, if you belong to me, surrender your life to me, then you will inherit heaven as your ultimate reward. God says to us basically that if you belong to my family, then you will inherit salvation as a free gift and the assurance of heaven when you die, a living hope and an inheritance kept in heaven for us, okay? But you have to be part of his family to get the inheritance. Okay, your name has to be in the will for you to get the inheritance. See, I, I know a lot of people go around, I've heard people all the time say things like, well, we're all God's children, we're all God's children. And I know what people mean when they say that, but that isn't technically true. No, we, were, we are all certainly God's creation, and God loves us all, but you are not a child of God until God becomes your father. And God does not become your father until you were born into his family. Well, how does that happen? This is why Jesus said in John chapter 3, unless a man or woman is born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. See, all of us experience physical birth. We come into this world through our mother, okay? We experience physical birth. But the Bible talks about a spiritual birth. We have to come to the place where we acknowledge Jesus as Lord that we might be born again. Our spirit can be regenerated, can be redeemed. Okay, this is spiritual birth. So how do I do that? You say, well, John 1, 12, Bible says, yet to as many as received him, to them that believed on his name, talking about Jesus, God gave the right to become children of God. The only way you become a child of God is when you receive Jesus and believe in him as your Lord and Savior, and then guess what? You get your eternal inheritance, which is ultimately heaven when we die. And this is what Jesus has opened for us because of what he did on the cross and rising from the dead. Heaven is, is real and heaven awaits all who believe in Christ. You have to belong to his family. You have to be born again. You have to receive and believe in Jesus. In 2016, Muhammad Ali died, one of the greatest boxing legends ever. And at his funeral, I, I remember watching his funeral on television. I tuned in with a lot of other people watching his funeral, and I'll never forget his wife, Lonnie, getting up to eulogize her now deceased husband. And she said something, I actually wrote it down, she said something in eulogizing Muhammad Ali, this is what she said, this is what Lonnie Ali said, quote, every morning he'd wake up, talking about Muhammad Ali, every morning he'd wake up and say, I just want to get to heaven, and I've got to do a lot of good deeds to get there, end quote. And I wrote it down, and my heart sank. My heart sank because what a futile thought to think. I hope every day I can just be good enough. I hope every day I can do enough good things. I hope every day I can just kind of do enough good things that will get God's favor, and I'll end up going to heaven because of all the good deeds. You see, this is what Muhammad Ali believed, and he believed it because he was born Cassius Clay, but at the age of 22, he converted to Islam and changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And Islam teaches, like every other world religion besides Christianity, that you have to perform in some way, do something, enough good works, enough good deeds, enough good things to please God. Maybe you'll get his favor. Maybe he'll like you and love you enough to take you to heaven. That's what Islam teaches. Other world religions similarly, Hinduism, Buddhism, the idea that if I just do enough good things, am I a good enough person, if I'm kind enough? I can reach moksha or nirvana or reincarnation. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Jesus shows up onto the world scene and he says, listen, everybody, none of you is good enough. None of us. None of us is righteous enough. None of us. Not you, not me. Well, none of us is good enough. 
We, we, we keep thinking if I could just work my way to heaven, work my way to heaven. What God says is you can't work your way to heaven. So God says, I will come down to you. And Jesus then comes, dies on a cross. He says, I'll take your sin. I'll take your guilt onto me. I'll take your punishment onto me. I'll take everything about you and your condemnation and your failures and your hopelessness. I'll put it on me. And in exchange, I'll give you my righteousness, my living hope, and my my eternal inheritance in heaven. What a deal. What a deal. And you can have that living hope and that eternal inheritance yourself if you'll humble yourself and invite him into your heart. That's what Easter's all about. If you come to him, and you just humbly say, Lord, I just, I need a relationship with you. I acknowledge I'm not good enough. I acknowledge I'm a sinner like everybody else. And I just need forgiveness. I need your living hope. And I want heaven when I die. Is that you today? Because if that's you, I'm going to give you the opportunity in just another minute to do a very bold and courageous thing. To get up out of your seat and to come and stand down front here. And then for everybody who's standing down front here, I'm going to lead in a collective word of prayer so that those who are down here can all receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. You see, that's kind of, that is kind of a bold thing. Listen, don't be embarrassed, no condemnation here. Everybody around you will applaud because you're making the most valuable and important decision of your life. People are happy for you, they'll celebrate with you. You're not coming down here to join the church, it's not about Cornerstone Chapel. You're not coming down to get religion, it's not about religion. It is about a relationship with the living Lord Jesus who loves you and died for you and offers you a living hope and the eternal inheritance of heaven when you die. And all you need to do is receive it. You just need to open your heart and receive it. Some of you, maybe you prayed a prayer a long time ago and you walked away from the Lord and today's a good day for you to recommit your heart to Christ. But when you come, God's going to meet you in a wonderful way. And so I'm going to pray first, then we're going to start to sing. As soon as we sing that song, don't be embarrassed and don't delay. Make it out of your seat and come stand down here. And then we're going to pray together. I'm going to make it on e easier on everybody who's wanting to walk. If you would, all please stand. I'm going to pray. Let's stand. You can even start to walk now while I'm praying. If you want to come down while we're, while we're even praying. Please, nobody leave and, and try to get a head start to the restaurant, all right? This is the most critical decision people will be making. Those of you in the overflow rooms, you can start coming now because we want you to join them down front here as well. Come on, let's pray. Lord, we come before you. We're thankful, Lord, that you died on a cross and you rose again because of your love for us. I pray right now, Lord, you would move on the hearts of men and women and young people to bring them to you, to a personal relationship with you. So, Father, glorify yourself now and draw people unto you, Lord. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come join those who have already come. Go sing. Come on, y'all. If you're up in the rake, come on down. If you're up in the rake, come on. God bless you. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your Come on, keep singing. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. God bless you. Come on, keep it's coming. Your Keep walking. God bless you. God bless you, ladies. Come on. Come on and join us.
We'll wait for you. God bless you all. We'll wait. Come on. Listen, maybe you're standing next to someone and you, you want to give them the non-guilty, non-guilty kind of glance. Don't shame them. Just like encourage them. Like, do you want to go? I'll go with you kind of a thing. Because maybe they just need a little encouragement and they'll come with you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on up. Anybody else? We're going to sing this again. If the Lord's tugging on your heart, don't delay. You come and join these folks. God bless you guys. Come on, let's sing. So We'll wait for you. Anybody else? Anybody else want to join us? God bless you. Come on down, ladies. Come on. God bless you. You guys want to join us? Come on. Come on. Come on, ladies. We'll wait for you. Come on down. bless you guys. All right, li listen to me on this. This is, this is the time when a pastor is like, okay, the tipping point. I don't want anybody to think he kept delaying it so that they would feel manipulated. I don't want anyone to feel manipulated. I just want to invite you. So I'm just going to pause 10 more seconds. And if the Lord just kind of dealing with your heart, I want to wait because we don't want to leave you out. I don't want you to leave here regretting. So this is, your, this is your moment to come. So I'm just gonna pause 10 seconds. Anybody else wanna come? You come, we'll wait. Okay. You all who have gathered down here, you're about to pray the most important prayer, make the most important decision you've ever made in your life. This is about knowing Christ in a personal way as your Lord and Savior. So I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and I'm gonna go slowly enough that you can repeat it after me. But I want you to pray this out loud with me. I want you to be bold about it. This is a new decision you're making to follow Christ. So I'll pray it slowly, you pray it with me out loud. Just repeat it after me, okay? Boldly, let's pray together. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, thank you I thank you that you died on a cross, on a cross. For, me, for me, that you love me, you. that you are here to save me, so I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to come into my life. Wash over me. I receive your living hope and the eternal inheritance of heaven. By faith, I trust you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Let's give God praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Stay here. Stay here, stay here, folks. Stay here, just a minute. We got our pastors now. They're gonna circulate through the crowd and they're gonna give you a Bible just to remember today's decision. There's a card inserted in the Bible that talks about next steps. Read that because we wanna be able to help you now in your journey with Christ. This is not just a one and done, we prayed it now. This is a journey now of following Christ and we want you to grow in your faith. So we're gonna give you these Bibles. Read that card about next steps. We're so excited for you. You know, the verse that always comes to my mind, church, is how the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. There's a symphony of praise going on in heaven right now. Right now. Amen. Amen. So listen, you, you stick around until you get your Bible. If you got your Bible, you can go ahead and go back to your seats. We're going to sing one last chorus. Let's lift up our praise to the Lord, folks. Come on, let's sing to him. Need a rest. 
rescue My sin was heavy The chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan Now you call me a citizen of heaven Have a great day. You're dismissed.